It would be good to investigate and to take the good experiences from that and transform into our new businesses. Which ones were not so good? Bioethics, which ones has functioned, which ones haven't? WTO, GATT, TRIPS. I think that uh, John Sulton talked about the, the IPR and the patenting. And in the EGE and other, in UNESCO and, and in other uh, organizations, we've often talked about the problems with patenting. Two broad patents, uh, the IPR, the, the ways of dealing with these things, the differences between Europe and US, etc. All the copying things doing and making in China, etc. Many problems. And somehow, what we've often asked for is we want to have some kind of analysis. How does it work? My feeling would be that in the universities, all this talk about patenting, it doesn't pay off very well. I traveled around also in the US to find out how much they did. The, the hospitals, they have patents, but the research as such, it's not, it's not that many. And the problem is that I think that uh, it's it's closing the way of dividing knowledge between university persons. And I think we need to have some kind of investigation or a research project or what have you to find out how it works. What do people think of it? We don't know. So everybody just says, well, it functions well, it's okay. They don't know, we don't know. We should try to find out why don't we do, we find a lot about climate change, technical this and technical that, but these kinds of, of governance measures we make, why don't we try out how they function? Yeah. And I think we should also find out uh, how can we make interpretation according to cultural differences? How, how has that function? When you're talking about the UNESCO declaration, for instance, best practices, what functions? Why don't we make some kind of suitcase traveling around that says, well, we have a number of ideas for different uh, persons, different cultures, different this and that. How can they contribute to the climate change is not being so bad, to the resources being built up, etc., etc.? We could do that. We could expand business ethics. We could create ways of securing resources, both to build responses to social needs into science policies and to channel results of science into policy process that addresses social needs. This was the UNESCO critics of our report, and I think he's correct. One of the crucial part would be whose initiatives should this be? And we need both governments, organizations, university, professions, NGOs. We need all of them with their different hats, their different abilities, their different expertises. So we need to get going. As this one just says, uh, not just lie there like the other one, but get going. And this is the next last. What now? We need engaged people. This is a Danish saying, and I haven't the faintest idea whether it works in English. To light a fire in others, you must be burning. Does it mean anything? You know what I mean anyway. You need to find engaged people to do something. Be a giraffe, dangerous, no natural enemies, and a big heart. We need to find giraffes in our human, you know, cultures. Ethics and governance are essential for persons, science, and responsible progress. And how can ethics and governance interact? We also need to know more about that to have research in those areas. My recommendation would be bioethics should include global aspects. We should use UNESCO, European Council, Council of Europe, National Ethics Council, Global Ethics Council. Ethics should be supported in other areas. Corporate social responsibility, the global compact, which is ethics for business, Unipri, which is ethics for finances, they should be expanded, uh, business prizes for people who do well in these areas, that's what you do. Making politicians and heads of state, they, they love prizes, give them some, if they're good at something like this, they love it. Governance, com governance intensive, diminished divides, capacity building, education, as it was mentioned yesterday, Brain circulation, instead of brain drain or brain gain, brain circulation, make sure that they come around. Carbon tax maybe, agreements, Copenhagen Accord. Global governance in the UN, UNESCO, WTO, G20. I think the G20 should be the ones doing, to, taking a lot, I was, I was at a global meeting about pension funds the other day. They have loads of money. And they want to be included because climate change is a risk for them. 
take it to the G20, they said, and make sure that they'll take on that so that we have money from those areas to use in this area. And open access. We are having a conference in Denmark about open access. We made a formal government policy about open access. UNESCO is working with it. Many others are working with it. IPR patents have said something about. And then, and this is where Ines comes in, we need some creative people to try to create general culture of responsibility. Use media, film. We're only using words. Words are not uh, the only things. And, and Ines is a specialist in using other remedies. We should take advantage of that. And interdisciplinary university research and education. So global ethics is needed, global governance too. This is just an e-learning tool. I'll have it so that you can write it down. It's, I've, I was part of a um, small project with Novo Nordisk, a very big pharmaceutical company in Denmark. And we made two decision-making tools for business ethics and an ethics dilemma tool. They are on the web. They're for free, open access, you know. And uh, you can use them to try to educate. This is what we should do, embrace each other. And this is just to say that creativity, collaboration needed. Denmark, a home of fairy tales, you need all these kinds of ways of dealing with it. It's very dangerous, I apologize for that. I really, really apologize, but just to make sure this is nice, isn't it? Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, um, Linda, for that uh, tremendously rich and um, informative uh, discussion. I particularly like the idea of the law as a friend, as not, not, not as a policeman, not as, a, not as a, a hostile enforcer trying to stop people from doing what they ought to do, but, um, or what they want to do, but um, leading the way towards the change of culture that we need. Well, now um, um, we're going to hear from um, Professor Christie. Uh, he may mention um, one or two uh, hitherto unknown ways in which our paths um, have crossed or very nearly crossed um, in, in, in the distant past. Um, uh, nearly crossed, but not quite, because as you can see, um, he, he's much younger than me, but um, there was a link, I gather, a while ago. And um, when he has finished, just to um, alert you to this, uh, I think we'll probably take a coffee break at that point, um, so in roughly half an hour's time. And um, then we will resume with our panelists and with the opportunity for everybody here to become involved in the discussion. We have until half past 12, so there's plenty of time for everybody to become involved, so please start thinking of your contributions now. But in the meantime, it gives me very great pleasure to introduce Professor George Christie from um, Duke University in North Carolina in the United States. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, as I begin, let me uh, again echo my colleagues and thank the Evianides Foundation for their kindness in inviting us to this uh, event and to the hospitality which they've extended to us. It is one feature of Greek life, which I am very proud as someone whose ancestors uh, came from uh, this country. and. Uh, it's one of the great traditions of Greek life, the hospitality to strangers and their kindness uh, to us. Uh, Stephen had mentioned that we have something in common, and uh, I had mentioned it to him. Uh, the fact that we were both uh, old boys from Jesus College, uh, Cambridge, to a Jesuits. And the importance of that rang home to me uh, some 20 odd years ago when I was in the St. Louis airport and a man in clerical garb across a crowded waiting room on a snowy day when it didn't look like the flights were going to leave, screamed across the uh, waiting room, are you a Jesus man? And I thought this guy was some religious fanatic uh, and was particularly embarrassed when he started moving towards me. Uh, but then I realized what the issue was as he got closer because I had over my overcoat a Jesus College scarf, which is very distinctive. It's red, black, and red and very long, you know, and it keeps you warm. And it turned out we had something in common. 
uh, because we had both uh, been to this institution, which is now over 500 years old. And as Peter Lachman said, you know, religion is something that keeps people together as a social force. Well, there are other social forces which actually give you some hope, because even if religions are intolerant, and even if old boy associations are intolerant, they're intolerant in different ways. And they <laughs> offset each other, and they enable us to live in the some element of uh, freedom. Now, as uh, the chairman has already noted, the how is the important uh, issue here. And uh, as we all know, to use another cliche, the, uh, the devil is in the details. And there are lots of details and lots of devils. What would be an ideal arrangement if you wanted to have uh, international uh, environmental law? You would have, in my view, a rather detailed convention which would be, which would also provide for an administrative apparatus to provide regulations for dealing with issues which are not fully described in the uh, document, the underlying document, and that's inevitable, uh, because again, the devil is in the details. And you need to have some arrangement for some centralized review of what is done at the local level. And I presume that's uh, the purpose of having an international uh, court, which would uh, deal not only with appeals from the administrative apparatus, but with uh, administrative uh, matters uh, coming from the local jurisdictions. That itself is not necessarily an e easy task. And it will expose the fact that there are different legal traditions in the world which create serious issues. Uh, they're already being experienced in the United Kingdom, uh, where the types of broad rights which are described in the European Convention of Human Rights, which are defeasible for all sorts of uh, social purposes, and when they come in conflict, let's say privacy and freedom of expression, are said to be of equal value. And even the dreaded Mr. Justice Eady has uh, agreed that freedom of expression is less free in the United Kingdom now that the United Kingdom has internalized the Human Rights uh, uh, Convention as domestic law rather than being something that applied to the UK uh, if you appeal to the European Court of Human Rights but was not directly uh, applicable uh, in the courts of uh, the United Kingdom prior to the 1998 uh, human rights law. So that would be the ideal. Uh, what we have at present are all kinds of hortatory expressions. And indeed, even the Greek Constitution in Article uh, 24 provides that the protection of the natural and cultural environment constitutes a duty of the state. The state is bound to adopt special preventive or repressive measures for the preservation of the environment Matters pertaining to the protection of forest and forest areas in general shall be regulated by law. Alteration of the use of state forests and state forest areas is prohibited, except where agricultural developments and other uses imposed for the public interest prevail for the national economy. Uh, Germany now has uh, also a provision, Article 20A of the Basic Law, which provides that mindful also of its responsibility towards future generations, the state shall protect the natural foundations of life and animals by legislation and in accordance with law and justice by executive and judicial action, all within the framework of the constitutional order. Uh, there are also hortatory expressions in a number of, a well, number, maybe four or five states in the United States actually have provisions uh, uh, claiming to uh, protect the environment and setting it forth as an obligation of the state.